want to start off by um, mentioning that this is this is a great opportunity here for all of us. Obviously, many of us are in our homes. We're unable to do a lot of the things we're accustomed to doing. Um, but it's provided us with opportunities to reach folks who might not normally come to an event in Lansing or come to the policy forum events, which this is, it's a policy forum event um, that we host all over the state of Michigan. I'm actually coming to you from um, sunny Land Lakes, Florida, uh, not Land Lakes, Minnesota, but Land Lakes, Florida, and um, enjoying the weather down here. But I think I'm indicative of what Mackinac has become over the past 30 years, an organization that has not just an impact and a foothold in Michigan, but all over the country and is impacting policy um, in all the states that have an impact on this country. Um, and no issue has a greater impact, we found. Um, no issue, no single campaign, no single issue for the last 50 years has been a greater obstacle to the work that you and I, you and, I um, and the Mackinac Center care about, like labor reform. Um, and we're going to talk about that here today. We've got two great speakers for you. One you're probably very, very familiar with and another that's been a, a part of the Mackinac Center for a number of years. The first, Joe Lehman, is the president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Um, originally came to the Mackinac Center in 1995. He later became vice president for communications at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C before returning to the Mackinac Center as its executive vice president and president, eventually president in 2008. Our other speaker, Vincent Fernuccio, president of the Institute for the American Worker, brings over a decade of expertise in labor law and policy and is regarded as one of the leading experts in this field. As a labor policy consultant, he has advised a multitude of policy and grassroots organizations throughout the country holds several advisory positions, including that of Senior Policy Advisor with the State Policy Network and Senior Fellow with the Mackinac Center. Um, he's a graduate of Ave Maria School of Law and most recently served on the U.S. Department of Labor's transition team for the Trump administration. So um, I want to start off actually with you, Vin. Um, we have obviously the, the Mackinac Center has been very active in Michigan and around the country um, through two campaigns, My Pay, My Say, and Workers for Opportunity. Um, but obviously, this virus has reset things for a lot of organizations and has pivoted a lot of opportunity for organizations to, to go in one direction um, or the other in terms of doubling down on efforts they were making before the virus or um, walking away. If you could talk a bit about what came out of the overall economic stimulus package? What are some good things that have come out of the, the package? And what are some things we should be concerned about? Sure, Don. And hey, thanks for having me on. And I tell you, it is great to be a senior fellow with uh, both the Mackinac Center and the Mackinac Center's Worker for Opportunity Labor Project that is uh, spreading the Mackinac vision for labor reform and worker freedom across the country. Uh, yeah, so you know, we've seen both good and bad coming out of both federal and state responses to the uh, to the coronavirus. Um, the, the stimulus itself, uh, especially uh, Mackinac, Mackinac Center staff like Mike Lafave, who uh, does fiscal policy, and James Holman, you know, they're looking at the stimulus as psychological. It's trying to keep people as whole as possible and doing their best to you know, basically make sure that people can support themselves during this time. Uh, but what I really want to focus on as far as what is good coming out are things like regulatory reform or licensing, easing of licensing restrictions, both at a federal and a state level. Uh, so first thing that comes to mind is medical licensing reform. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is now allowing doctors to practice medicine across state lines. Because, Don, you, you know, when you cross state lines, your anatomy and physiology changes. And uh, mm -hmm. before you had to have licenses in different states in order to practice. So that's been relaxed. Um, Michigan has relaxed certificate of need laws and hospital bed licensing, so hospitals can now more easily expand capacity. Uh, Michigan, is make, Michigan and other states are making telemedicine easier and allowing medical practitioners to do more, not just stay in their narrow scope of practice. 
Um, many other states are, li are easing restrictions on licensing and regulation, uh, such as you know, being able to pick up drinks from restaurants, which was forbidden before. You're seeing expansion of online learning, easing of trucking regulations to allow truckers to work longer hours, uh, which, they have done, which they have asked for in the past, but uh, Department of Transportation laws and regulations have prevented them. You're also seeing businesses stepping up. And, you know, the Mackinac Center has done some great work highlighting businesses that are giving back and the private sector stepping up without government mandates, such as Ford making ventilators, Dow and uh, Michigan distilleries making hand sanitizer, the Greek Town Casino giving free rooms to first responders. Um, so, you know, Mackinac has been making these suggestions documenting these really good things and you know especially things like michigan uh certificate of need and all these medical reforms these are things that the mackinac center suggested and um only a couple days to a week or so later you saw actually get enacted in the governor's emergency order so that's the good mm -hmm. unfortunately now we have to talk about some of the bad and um you know the first national bad thing that i saw come to come to light is in the CARES Act. So this was that phase three of the coronavirus stimulus package. Um, one of the provisions, and actually I think the Mackinac Center, we were one of the first to really hone in on this and expose it, and it got picked up across the country, Real Clear Politics, uh, several other outlets cited our blog post on it. Um, and that was a requirement in um, one of the loan provisions that if the recipient took the loan and they would then have to be neutral in a union organizing campaign to essentially stifle their First Amendment rights. If they took this loan, they couldn't talk to their employees about what unionization would do. Uh, David, for unionized employers. If I could pause you on that one, why, now why, if you could go into that a little deeper, why is that a, a bad thing um, when it comes to labor reform and, and worker freedom? Sure. Well, when uh, and we're talking about private sector unions here. Um, this is uh, the loan is geared toward mid-sized employers between 500 and 10,000 employees. And mm -hmm. what this provision said is that if a union comes to organize you, that you can't talk to your employees about what would happen if mm -hmm. the union was successful. So essentially, it instituted a gag order on these employers if they took the loan. I'm talking to their employees. So just imagine a presidential campaign where one candidate gets to say whatever they wanted, gets to give their talking points, be on TV, do speeches, and the other candidate literally could not say anything. That's what this loan provision is doing to employers during unionization campaigns. And for unionized employers, it's actually um, preventing them from amending collective bargaining agreements up to two years after the loan even expires. So if you're in trouble, you take one of these loans, you can't even adjust your business practices um, to respond. Uh, so that was troubling. We actually just um, submitted feedback to the Federal Reserve and Treasury on it. And there's a blog post um, with more details that, uh, that we can send around. Great. Other bad things that haven't come into uh, fruition yet, hopefully will not, are um, things like the Democrat, the federal Congressional Democrats Family First Corona Response Act, which is just chock full of bad ideas that have nothing to do with the health and economic safety of Americans responding to the coronavirus, uh, responding to the coronavirus, um, such as more employer neutrality, if um, companies uh, take these loans, giving unions a seat on airline boards, employee representation, in other words, union representation on more corporate boards, collective bargaining agreement protection, a union pension bailout for private sector unions, and now that what we're seeing is states trying to get stimulus funds to bail out their own massively underfunded, historically underfunded uh, public pensions as well. So there's a lot of troubling things out there, but there's good as well as the bad. Were you referring to what Illinois was asking for with a pension bailout? From That's right, Illinois, New York, several other you know, the states that you could probably imagine that had troubles far before this crisis hit are now trying to get the feds to step up and bail them out. Well, we've spoken about 
the positives and negatives that came out of the overall uh, CARES Act, what should we, in your estimation, what should we start to prepare for in the post-COVID economy, um, positive and negative? Sure. Well, uh, you know, unions are obviously trying to organize more, use this. I mean, uh, the Democrats of the unions, as you've seen with that, uh, that Family First Corona Response Act on a federal level and, you know, pushes on a state level and union organizing, um, they're taking Rahm Emanuel's advice to heart and they're never letting a good crisis go to waste. Um, what we should be focusing on is not taking advantage of crisis, but we need to be out there with ideas. And the world has changed and the world will be changed even when things do get back to normal and they will get back to normal, but it will be a new normal. And we have to be out there and the Mackinac Center is at the forefront of being out there with ideas to make sure that the new economy is shaped around free market principles and unleashing the power of entrepreneurs because they're the ones that are gonna bring this economy back. So first and foremost, a focus on independent contracting and freelancing and removing some of the barriers that are put in place uh, towards freelancers and independent contractors. Um, first and foremost, especially during this crisis, um, allowing businesses to provide benefits for independent contractors without tripping up employment law. And uh, the House Republicans actually have a great idea on this. Um, they, uh, Chairwoman, our uh, Minority Leader Fox on the committee, um, Congresswoman uh, Virginia Fox, she put out mm -hmm. a plan and um, the Mackinac Center has been talking about this. We're educating on this, allowing companies to provide things like paid sick leave, um, grants, other things, 401ks and things to independent contractors without them now falling into that employment rubric uh, which unfortunately current law um, would mandate. Um, it's going looking further, streamlining the definition of independent contractor on a federal level. Um, unfortunately, there's two separate laws, um, uh, uh, there's two separate federal laws that have two separate definitions and two separate types of regulations defining who is an employee versus who is an independent contractor. We obviously want the more streamlined common law approach that makes it easier to be an independent contractor, to be an entrepreneur, work for yourself, create your own business. Um, and that's the, uh, the IRS definition as opposed to a little bit more strict um, Fair Labor Standards Act or Department of Labor definition. Um, and finally, once those are done, which probably can be done more in the near term, especially that providing benefits, I think that should be done almost immediately going long term and making it so that entrepreneurs and independent contractors can, if they want to work for themselves and start up a business, they can without the people that they are contracting with uh, worrying about tripping up employment law. Um, so we're working very closely um, with um, Republicans on the Hill, as well as the business community to make sure that that's done, uh, done correctly. Also, easing um, licensing restrictions, the Mackinac Center, especially like Jared Scora, both in Michigan and working around the country, has done great work easing licensing, allowing businesses to start and prosper. Um, easing zoning restrictions to allow for more home-based businesses. Or, you know, right now, especially when we are in this um, uh, stay-at-home mandate, um, mm -hmm. some states are doing better than others, and I won't, you know, I won't name names here. Um, but allowing home-based businesses to flourish and people to work for themselves, entrepreneurs to come out, run businesses out of their home without tripping up uh, archaic zoning laws or licensing or regulatory restrictions, prohibiting people from doing things that aren't creating a nuisance or bothering their neighbors, but simply earning a living from home. And uh, we had an article in The Hill, I think it was a week and a half, two weeks ago, that uh, really outlined this vision of how to bring America back to work and what life will look like in the post-COVID economy. Right. And, and for, our, um, for our listeners and, and viewers, we will try and get you all the information that's mentioned here by our speakers um, in a post-event email, uh, or, or, your, or you'll be able to find it on our website. So you can reference back um, the, the, the articles and the blog posts that are being mentioned here. Then you mentioned um, the 
onerous regulations on independent contractors. Um, that was that is where it's particularly onerous coming out of California. Um, California has right. been very and a very important state for the labor reform fight um, that has been executed by the Mackinac Center in conjunction with our partner, the California Policy Center and um, State Policy Network. Um, why California? And why is it so important to our to our success around the country as we work in numerous states to try to execute uh, sound uh, labor policy re reform? That's right. So we're uh, we're partnering very closely with the California Policy Center out there. Um, they have, when it comes to freelancing and independent contracting, one of the most onerous law in the country, and they have you know a several factor test to finding who is an employee and who is an independent contractor. And I won't get into all the tests, except to say that simply it makes it nearly impossible for gig workers to operate, for people like freelance writers and uh, especially people in the media business that work for themselves to operate. Um, and what you, what you saw in California is unfortunately, this went into effect at the tail end of last year, right before this economic downturn and right before the shelter in place orders and the whole coronavirus hit. So you had people like freelance writers that were working from home, basically doing jobs where they could be earning a living while social distancing. Perfect, perfect opportunities in the current crisis in California right before it hit. Then now you can't do that anymore, sorry. And it was a push by the unions to basically define everyone as an employee so then they could be further organized. Um, so we're working with California Poly Center. We have uh, stories from all over that state. And I tell you, I, I, you know, we have dozens and dozens of these stories that have been coming in via email, and they are absolutely heartbreaking of people saying, I had a great business. Um, I had multiple clients. I was able to earn a living. I was able to support my family, or I was able to make side income on this. And then this AB5 bill happened and all my clients abandoned me because they were worried about tripping up employment law, and now I can't work. And that was even before the crisis hit, and it's only been exacerbated ever since. So that's in California at a state level. Um, we are working with California Policy to educate on the disastrous effects of AB5 out there, but unfortunately, California is not alone. And there's federal legislation such as the Protecting the Right to Organize Act or the PRO Act, which would do just horrible, horrible things that I won't get into the, you know, the several different provisions, uh, including taking away the secret ballot from employees and several other things. Uh, the Mackinac Center has written extensively and actually has a study on that. Um, but one of the things the PRO Act would do was basically Californize the entire country um, when it comes to freelancing and independent contracting. Um, and it would absolutely be devastating for these type of gig economy workers and people that do work for themselves, the entrepreneurs, um, by making it so the entire country is like California and people would not be able to be an entrepreneur and really work for themselves without jumping through all these onerous hoops. Mm. So we mentioned at the start of the uh, conversation, uh, Mackinac's work on My Pay My Say and Workers for Opportunity why is it, in your, in your opinion, why is it important for Mackinac and its coalition partners to keep up the pressure um, on these two areas during this time, while uh, many others are just exclusively reporting on or focused on the virus itself? Why is labor reform, why does it still matter um, at this time? Absolutely. Well, I mean, things will eventually get back to normal. It will be a new normal, but things will get back to normal, and we are not letting up on the gas. Um, there are definitely things that are shifting a focus, and we are, like you see with these distilleries or uh, with Dow and Ford, shifting to hand sanitizer or making ventilators. You know, we're doing the, the same equivalent with policy, such as shifting towards making uh, defending entrepreneurship and independent contracting and home-based businesses and licensing reform. And, you know, Jared Scorer from Akadar has been doing great work on that as well. Um, that being said, we still have a lot of work that was getting done and we were getting very close, um, especially in several states with making sure that they're implementing the Janus decision, which gave right to work to public employees across the country and also made sure that their right 
to opt into a union would be respected and making sure that unions couldn't just say, yeah, they want to pay us and have the state take their word for it. It made it so that they um, had the ability to opt in and that that was confirmed. Um, so we're still working on that. We're still working on our government union reform efforts. Um, and we're not letting off on the gas because when things do come back to normal, all those issues are going to still be there. But we're doing it at the same time. We are pivoting to make sure workers and entrepreneurs are protected during and after the coronavirus crisis. You mentioned the opt-in um, legislation. Where, uh, um, where has this been accomplished thus far? And where is it still in the works that we're now still waiting um, while this virus passes? Sure. Well, it was introduced as um, HB1 in Florida, so it had tremendous support down there. Uh, we saw bills in Oklahoma. Uh, we saw, we're seeing bills in Kansas. Um, you know, I've testified and worked with a lot of the people on the ground in those areas. Uh, we saw, obviously, an attorney general opinion and followed by an executive order coming out of Alaska. Um, so, you know, the Janus opt-in effort, making sure that public employees' choices are respected and confirmed, it was and is going strong and will be going strong, especially when things do get back to normal. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Alaska because um, the unions are obviously taking that very seriously because they've ratcheted up a Scott Walker-like recall effort on the governor there as a result of that um, executive order. So. Clearly, it's something that is, is agitating them and they recognize as a threat in the state of Alaska. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, then thank you so much. We'll be come back, coming back to you with some questions from our um, audience. But I want to now turn to our president, Joe Lehman. And um, I believe many of our, Joe, I believe many of our supporters and coalition partners <laughs> want to know what the status is of the American worker at this time. Um, and why does Mac Mackinac continue to invest resources into labor policy reform? There we go. I had to un unmute myself. And um, what is the status of the of the American uh, worker? Uh, is your question. And before I get into that, I just want to say, as I as I briefly look down the list of attendees. Fantastic to see so many longtime Mackinac Center donors. And uh, donors don't always come to our policy events in Lansing. Those are policy makers, uh, but this one uh, is easy for people. Yeah. We're so grateful for our support with us uh, because we've all had decisions to make about where our resources go. There are plenty unknowns yet. We made a decision early on at Mackinac that we had a higher new front open up that needed to be fought, and that is the virus, all the health challenges there, but also the public policy challenges. But we also decided that we had to stay on offense on our most important policy goals, policy goals that would transcend the virus and Mackinac Center. That really is labor policy. And so when we look at American workers, uh, we see them uh, right now at a time of needing maximum flexibility, just in order to get by to help their employers figure out how to keep how to keep um, business open and, and keep it uh, profitable or at least alive. Um, Everybody needs maximum flexibility right now, but the conventional unionism is the opposite of flexibility. Conventional unionism is really a, sort of an outsider coming into an engagement with an employer and being able to compel the worker to pay dues, being able to compel uh, the employer to bargain. And uh, they can even keep the worker from, from getting his or her own best deals. And so 
we see it as America will never be at its highest potential as long as workplace compulsion is baked into the cake. And I look for I look for some statistics on well, how is the, the pandemic affecting unionized workers in particular? Because it's really left nobody untouched. Almost. That's almost the case. Uh, it's really a patchwork right now, Don. Don't uh, have uh, good statistics. We've got some anecdotes on uh, unionized and non union Not enough to say with confidence of really how much is being affected. I, I will say, though, that the public sector union employees, employees like uh, teachers and um, functionaries, traders, bureaucrats, and various government, state, and federal, uh, look, they're they're protected. But they uh, they you know they may have to be working from home, like a lot of us are doing, uh, but most of them have not lost a paycheck. But uh, you know, like like some of the um, uh, non-unionized uh, workers out there, the uh, and, and many of the private sector workers, union and non-unionized, because of the lockdown and social. And uh, saw an interesting headline this morning. Uh, we have this uh, spectacle of mm -hmm. hospitals laying off massive numbers of employees. Yeah. And how can that be happening in the middle of a pandemic? And, and I'm bringing it up now because a lot of hospital workers are typically doing that. Well, in this, uh, this particular headline was Beaumont Hospital in Michigan. Uh, mm -hmm. Centered in the Detroit area, they announced this morning at 9 o'clock they're laying off 2,475 workers and they're eliminating 650 jobs. Now, why is that? Well, it's because we have uh, the, the restrictions in Michigan, and this varies from state to state, but Michigan. The restrictions have defined a lot of uh, uh, medical services as elective, and so and people also on their own are avoiding going to the doctor, even if they've got something kind of serious uh, wrong with them. So a combination of the factors has led to hospital revenue is uh, drying up because people aren't coming in for routine tests. Uh, you know, they're still showing up at the emergency room if they've got uh, COVID-19 symptoms. Mm -hmm. Sure, but the hospitals don't make very much money. Oh, they lose money, many of them. Uh, but the, the routine uh, things like uh, tests and elective surgeries, uh, I, I even had uh, a medical procedure that I thought was necessary according to my doctor, but when I got there, they... So, uh, that really affecting affecting a lot of uh, people. But the reason that we have decided to stay focused on uh, labor and unions across the whole country, we're a Michigan think tank, but when it comes to labor, we want to share our expertise across the whole country. That's because in Michigan, we won't fix our union problem until we prove the union situation everywhere. And that's because union money is fungible. Uh, unions have too often become a, a way of uh, hobbling and constraining uh, workers. Uh, and pandemic is a uh, time when what we need is flexibility. And just to show you the strength that unions have, even in a time of crisis in Michigan, I want to read you a couple sentences from one of our governor's executive orders. And this is uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer has issued a couple of executive orders. The first one was second with regard to uh, stay at home and restrictions uh, of, of that nature. Uh, she says, for purposes of this order, critical infrastructure workers also include, and she uses the term critical infrastructure because critical infrastructure workers have the least restrictions on them. They're still free to make a living and go on sort of as normal. For purposes of this order, critical infrastructure workers also include 
workers who perform critical labor union function. And so unions in Michigan still, even after right to work, they still have enough influence, at least for the Democrat governor to say, look, we want a special provision in the executive order that allows us to go about our business while everything else. And uh, whether whether or not that's uh, appropriate and truly critical, I suppose we'll have time to analyze uh, out of this. But I, I think it's remarkable that it's in the um, all of a sudden private organizations and special uh, privileges that uh, that others don't seem to have. I don't know either. Didn't. Yeah, and that and that that's the key that I think a lot of people don't realize. Perhaps not our supporters because they're so well educated on the subject matter, but that labor unions are private organizations. They're not an attachment of the uh, attached to the to the state or federal government. So these are private organizations that are being carved out special exemptions. Yeah, that, and that's exactly right. And that you know that really it shapes our understanding of what the ideal labor policy should be in the country. And it is simply this, that government ought to be neutral with respect to labor unions. Government shouldn't prevent workers from getting together and trying to get a better deal as a group, mm -hmm. but government shouldn't often give those workers special privileges when they do get together and try to get a better deal. The government should you know, frankly, treat labor unions uh, like it treats the Rotary Club. It, the Rotary Club is free to have members and negotiate discounts for its members and do whatever it wants to do. Uh, the government doesn't really weigh in one way or another with, with the Rotary Club. But there's another uh, crucial distinction we make when we're thinking about labor unions. And that is the difference between public sector unions and private sector. They're really different animals. Uh, public sector unions are, I'm sorry, private sector unions are really the ones we think about when we, when we think about um, the sort of glorious history of the heyday of, of unions when, when we see the photographs and hear the stories of working conditions harsh and you can kind of understand why workers wanted to band together and get a better deal for themselves. Those were private sector unions. And the idea that unions would form in the government sector was a strange idea. And even in the 1930s, FDR, probably uh, the best friend labor unions ever had in the presidency, uh, even he said, and I'll read the quote word for word, he said, all government employees should realize that the process of collective bargaining, as usually understood, cannot be transplanted in service. Now that's a quote from a, from a longer piece, but FDR understood innately that it was one thing to unionize in the private sector. If you unionize in the government sector, you would you had the potential to politicize government even more than it was. You you had the you were really setting up workers to negotiate against the taxpayers because for government workers, it's the taxpayers who pay the bills. FDR knew that would be bad for government. It would be, it would be bad for taxpayers. It would be bad for the workers. It would be bad for government services and those who depend on them. So we make that distinction um, probably for a lot of the same reasons that FDR uh, warned that government sector that deal. Well, sure enough, decades and decades later, we see that it is public sector unions who are the major union players when it comes to funding political campaigns. And Benny talked about the Janus decision uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court in 2016. That was just a, that was a landmark decision, or a, a two, 2018. Yep. And, um, it essentially made all government unionized workers right to work employees. Why is this important? You know that unions of all kinds spend about $2 billion every two years on elections, campaigns, others. 
it's an enormous amount of money um, that, that dwarfs almost every other source. And even in states that aren't, um, um, pick a state like California, which is probably going to go uh, Democratic in every presidential election in the U.S. Uh, it's also a very, very heavily unionized state with respect to public sector workers. Mm -hmm. So, and the dues, the union dues are unusually high there. Well, what do they need all that money for? What do the unions need that money for if they favor the Democrats and the Democrats already have a big advantage? Yep. Here's why they need that money. So they can send the money to other states where the Senate races and the president competitive and they can help their Democratic allies win. And um, it, it, this would be a problem even if the unions were one-sided supporters of the Republican Party. The, the, the fact of the matter is the, the public sector unions have become a way to sort of launder tax money into the political system, and it's gotten way out of balance. Uh, there is a little bit of Republican support, uh, but, but not very much. And so we've stayed focused in forming workers of the rights under the Janus decision. They can now resign from their union. We're going even further with uh, legislation and executive orders, helping governors and legislatures create environments where workers affirmatively have to opt into a union if that's what they what they really want. Why are they doing why are we doing all this education uh, work now in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> uh, it's because freedom is not self-executing. The the fact that the Supreme Court recognizes workers' rights is nice, but it doesn't help those workers if they don't know they have those rights. So that's why we're focusing. Well, and you mentioned while many labor union activities are being labeled as critical infrastructure activities, we can be sure that they're still educating their workers on um, remaining in the union. And we are for certain that they're still collecting dues during this time. They haven't stopped collecting dues at this time while workers are suffering all over the country. They're still taking dues from people's paychecks. Yeah, that, that's um, uh, that's right, and, and in you know many cases that's that's voluntary. Uh, there will always be people who will support a union, probably no matter what that union does. Uh, we we just think people should should have uh, should have the choice. But if we uh, can educate all of the workers, so that anybody who wants to exercise the choice has a clear path to do so. Uh, Political spending will uh, be a little bit more leveled on the playing field. We'll have a government that works for everybody, uh, not just one party or not. And we will have tax money that we'll see go further, more infrastructure, better health system, better education. What will be the impact on Michigan and the country at large if Mackinac is successful in its efforts in bringing about public sector labor reform? If, if we are successful in our final vision, it, it would be government neutrality toward labor unions. And uh, my colleague, Vinny, uh, who, who's on this, uh, this show today, you know, Vinny's done a great deal of work kind of envisioning what could union look like uh, out in a world where they did not have these compulsory abilities. Uh, there's no reason unions could not be brokers of labor. There's no reason unions couldn't uh, be experts at providing insurance for workers. No reason unions couldn't be expert at providing safety training, working with employers. You know, like Underwriters Laboratories works with manufacturers to certify that certain goods meet certain standards. There's there's tons that, that can be done in um, in the world of labor and employment, uh, but for right now the unions have chosen this business model of compulsion, and it, it's got them back into a corner that it's not. I'm going to put this question out to uh, either you, Joe, or Van, if you want to um, answer it. Um, 
If you could briefly summarize, how did we arrive at the Janus decisions? What, what is the brief history that brought us that Janus decision in 2018? Vinny, why don't you take that? Sure, just, uh, just getting off mute here. <laughs> um, so the Janus decision was a long time coming. Uh, the Mackinac Center um, has obviously been working on this issue for decades. Um, and, uh, you know, Michigan went right to work in uh, 2012. Uh, Mackinac Center was at the heart of that, fighting a ballot initiative that would have given government unions in Michigan effectively a veto over legislation. Um, literally, it would have given every collective bar government collective bargaining agreement in Michigan the power of the Constitution so they could have actually overridden laws passed by our elected representatives. That eventually led to right to work, and then you saw um, other states saying, well, hey, if Michigan can do it, so can we in Mackinac Center. That's when we started our really pushing our national labor reform effort, telling the story of how Michigan went right to work. But during all of this, there was a legal fight bubbling up, and uh, you know, we supplied amicus briefs and um, uh, ideas to this fight, and essentially it said that Everything that government unions do is inherently political. So when you think about it, um, if unions are bargaining for a higher pay raise, what is that? That's tax money. If they're bargaining for a longer or shorter workday, what is that? That's public policy. Even if they're bargaining for more parking spaces, that's public policy. So there's this idea that everything government unions do is inherently political. And that started to go through the court system. Uh, there was a California teacher, Rebecca Friedrichs, um, who went with uh, 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 CIR, uh, Coalition of Indi uh, the Center for Individual Rights, um, and she fought all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now, unfortunately, this was 2016, and um, I was in the court with Pat Wright, Mackinac Center. We uh, supplied amicus briefs. We were very instrumental working with CIR, also National Right to Work, and several other groups. And it looked like she won. You could just tell by the questions. The unions came out, the kind of heads were lowered, realizing they had lost. But unfortunately, a couple months later, before the decision was issued, Justice Scalia passed away. Um, with that, the court had a hung decision. Essentially, nothing really happened. Um, basically affirmed the lower court. That didn't change anything in California. Um, and life went on. Um, then new Supreme Court justices were appointed. Uh, and a new case came with Mark Janis, who is a child support specialist out of Illinois, um, found by our sister organization, the Illinois Policy Institute. And that case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. It was the Liberty Justice Center, the legal arm of Illinois policy with national right to work. Uh, we were there on the ground working with those attorneys, giving that amicus brief, giving that expert uh, feedback. Mark Janice's court uh, case went to the Supreme Court, and then in June of 2018, the Supreme Court, with a newly constituted nine members, said yes, everything government unions do is inherently political. Public employees across the country have a First Amendment right to choose whether or not to pay a union, essentially giving them right to work rights. But they actually went further, and not a lot of people paid attention right after the decision. Um, the Supreme Court didn't just say you have basically have right to work, the First Amendment right to pay or not. They also said that unions have to have what Justice Alito called evidence of affirmative consent. So essentially, workers have to opt in to paying the union. And that is one of the things that the Mackinac Center is working on across the country, showing that not only do public employees have to opt in to paying the union, that has to be timely. They couldn't have waived a right they didn't know they had. So any opt-in before Janice is likely not valid, that those waivers can't expire. Think of Miranda rights. Um, you can't say, hey, take dues and that lasts forever. That has to expire um, at a certain time. Also, we've seen evidence of unions actually forging signatures on dues checkoff forms. So not only do they have to opt in, not only does it have to be timely, but there has to be some sort of confirmation, did you really mean to do this? 
and the confirmation and the initial opt-in should go directly to their employer, to the state or the city or the municipality or the school district. So it's not just saying, hey, unions, take our word for it. So all those safety precautions, that is one of Mackinac's big efforts right now in labor reform is making sure that public employees' rights are respected and that if unions are taking money from public employees' paychecks, they're doing it the right way. Thanks for that explanation, Ben. I'm going to turn to the uh, chat box here. We have a few questions that I want to go through, and, and I think we can get through all of them before our event concludes at um, 12 o'clock Eastern time. First question from Freda. And I, this was answered in the chat box, but I'd love to hear a verbal um, answer to this as well for those that perhaps didn't read it. Why aren't tech companies uh, fighting um, AB5? Well, they are. And, um, you know, they have been doing a good job. Unfortunately, they're trying to look after themselves and not what's best public policy. So we're seeing companies that did come out against AB5, but now they're still saying, hey, that's a bad idea. But instead of really putting all their eggs and that's a bad idea, let's repeal it, basket. They're saying, well, it's a really bad idea. It's especially bad for us, so give us a carve out. We don't want to see carve outs to AB5. We want to see AB5 repealed in its entirety. Let entrepreneurs work. Let them earn a living in the, in the way that is best for them. And especially during this time of economic upheaval, upheaval let them earn a living how they want to without government getting it away. Full repeal of AB5, not a specialized carve out, like unfortunately we're seeing a lot of special interest look for in California. If, if I can add something here, and, and this is sort of, sort of a, uh, uh, I guess I'll call it a point of education about, uh, this perfectly illustrates uh, why at the Mackinac Center, we favor government policies that in general apply equally to everyone. So whatever the policy is, it should apply equally to everyone. And this is a great example. It would be, uh, you see this a lot in corporate taxation where a state uh, will have a certain uh, tax rate and maybe that tax rate's too high. Maybe, you know, corporations would uh, work to, to get that overturned. But what if the biggest corporations in the state instead go get a special tax cut just for them? And we see that, we've seen that here in Michigan with the auto companies. So they get their tax cut, which, which may be good, but they lose any incentive whatsoever to then work hard to get the tax rate lowered on everybody else. And it just sets up that whenever government policies treat one group different from another, it, it, that's up, um, um, it, it really perverts the system and the, it, it's harder to get reform done for the rest of it. Thanks for that comment. Yeah, I think uh, Freda's response to that was great. Say no carve outs, it's good for everyone or it's good for no one. Yeah. Thank you, Freda. Thank you for that. Um, next question from Rich Weber. What can we do as individuals to stop the phase three pork that's in these bills? Um, contacting legislators seems to be ineffective. Uh, there seems to be very little opposition. A lot of the pork that's been put into um, these, these um, bailouts or stimuluses, whatever you want to call it. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'll open that up to either Vin or Joe, whoever wants to take that. Joe, I'll let you take first crack. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, Mr. Weber, that, that is, a, it is a very, very tough one, particularly when you've got a stimulus which is widely perceived as greatly needed, and it's moving very fast, and nobody wants to be the lawmaker who gets in the way of potentially millions of people getting the help that they need. So this this is the perfect bad storm. And how do we stop the how do we stop the pork? This is a case where one particularly egregious example can galvanize things. I'm remembering, uh, I believe it was Senator U.S. Senator Tom Coburn uh, who pointed out, uh, who called attention to the so-called bridge to nowhere being built in Alaska. And we, and we, 
You maybe didn't even remember that it was in Alaska, and I don't even remember how much this bridge cost, but I remember the phrase, the bridge to nowhere. It was memorable. And it kind of was a bridge that didn't go anywhere. And it was a bridge that if it was built, it would have, uh, nobody really would have needed it. And so Senator Coburn almost single-handedly threw attention to what may have been the worst chunk of pork in that spending bill. And it uh, resulted in some other provisions in the bill getting more scrutiny and eventually uh, removed or, or carved uh, carved down. So that's, uh, that is a method that we have seen work with some success, but in order to, um, in order to achieve kind of ultimate success, this is why you need organizations like the Mackinac Center and other think tanks, because the, we're not, I would predict we won't fix this with this third stimulus package. It will take a change in mindset of representatives for Congress. And so that, that's a long-term project and it's longer than one. Thank you for that. Uh, I think that's a, a great answer to um, Mr. Weber's question. Um, next question, I think, um, is for Vin. Vin, and I think you responded to this, but again, I'd love to hear a, um, it, it further explained. Um, you were talking about the PPP loan having strings attached to it regarding potential labor organizing efforts. Um, it was unclear as to which part of the CARES Act you were speaking of in regards to those strings attached. Could you clarify? Absolutely. Just want to make sure I'm not. Yes, I'm not on mute. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. If you check the uh, if you check the chat box, I sent you over links of um, first the link. The first link was uh, while they were still debating. Um, so uh, the citation there, at least as the page number goes, is incorrect because, uh, as Joe said, uh, with these we have to remain diligent. And literally, when this you know thousand plus, I think it actually made it up to fourteen hundred pages. Um, bill came down. We're literally going Control F and typing in different, uh, you know, union taglines to see what was there. Uh, but it's the Main Street Loan Program, um, and uh, there's two separate sections. Uh, one is union neutrality, and the next is um, uh, allowing collective bargaining agreement to last during the entire length of the loan plus two years. Uh, the exact sections and page numbers and links. Those are in the comments. Happy to send those after the call. Um, also in the comments, um, with the correct page number and section, uh, is Mackinac's feedback to uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury and the Federal Deserve, Reserve on their implementation of uh, the CARES Act. And that's something where you know, there may be an impact now where the law was passed, but the regulators are still trying to figure out how to implement it. And uh, at the Mackinac Center, we are submitting comments and feedback to say, hey, wait a minute, uh, you know, do this carefully. And by the way, these sections of law may infringe on other sections and other rights. Um, so uh, make sure that anything that comes out is very narrowly tailored. But check out the links and we can send them after this call as well. Great, Ben. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And I'm going to actually follow up on an answer that Joe gave earlier regards to what success would look like for the Mackinac Center on My Pay, My Say and Workers for Opportunity. I want to dig down a little deeper on that with the time remaining and ask, quantitatively speaking, what would success look like in terms of the amount of money um, that would be removed from the, those $2 billion that you mentioned, Joe, um, that are being spent on elections and policy campaigns um, every election cycle? Uh, sure. The, uh, we, we actually have tried to estimate um, how much it might affect uh, the, the discretionary funds available to unions if everybody just had a, had a free choice for the union uh, without compulsion. And what we, uh, admittedly, it's an estimate, uh, but we did have the Michigan experience to go from. So we had, we had a, an important data point, even though it's only one data point in, in recent history. In Michigan, 
when uh, the state went right to work, as Vinny said, uh, legislation passed in 2012, took effect in 2013. You know, over the next year, not very much happened. Very few people resigned from their union. And it was because workers just simply did not know about their rights. They did, and, they, and if they did, they did not know how to go through the process of resigning because the unions controlled that process. So the Mackinac Center got to work. And over a three-year period, through educating workers, um, over that three years, about 20% of the workers in the state's largest government unions, about 20% of them managed to successfully resign from the union. And as we went a little bit further, uh, another couple of years, we saw that the union revenue was down 30%, and we saw that the union's political spending was down 50%. Uh, and, and the reason those numbers don't match is, is think about it. Uh, political spending for a union is, is a variable cost. That's discretionary money. Uh, the fixed costs are, you know, things like their pension obligations, like, uh, you know, if they have a mortgage on the building, and maybe they treat some of their labor, internal labor costs as cost. So, um, so now scale up the Michigan experience to the whole country. Sort of our back of the envelope calculation was if all we do is match the Michigan experience, but across all the states affected by the Janus decision, we're not just talking a few uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars. We're talking at least $600 million a year coming out of perhaps the $2 billion. Uh, that the union is now spending in every two-year election cycle. And let me make one thing perfectly clear. The $600 million, that's a revenue change per year for the unions. So in a two-year election cycle, it's $1.2 billion uh, compared to the uh, right, latest numbers show about $2 billion in political spending. They may, uh, it may have huge effect on political spending in the country. So, and that's just looking at the political aspect, that is to say nothing of how this would uh, put pressure on unions to be more reasonable with their work, work rules and how that could improve the economy. That is to say nothing of how millions of workers would have another thousand bucks a year in their pocket of union dues that they could they could spend on a vacation, they could spend on private tutoring, they could, they could spend to get the roof fixed, they could spend to put in their 401k. You know, all, all kinds of things. Thanks for that, Thanks for that clarification, Joe. It, it really sets the stage for what's at stake here. And this is a game-changing um, campaign that's being executed around the country. And um, the success is critical to the future of the country, not just in Michigan, um, not just in California and the other states where we're active on the ground, but as you mentioned earlier in the conversation, states like Florida, where I live, and Texas, and Missouri, and Oklahoma, where a lot of this money flows in from places like California, and New York, and New Jersey. So this is a 50-state project, and um, it takes a, a real concerted effort to, to achieve success, because obviously there's a lot of vested interest into making sure that we're not successful, um, and making sure that we don't um, achieve that vision. Um, I want to thank Vin and Joe for taking an hour out of their day, even though we're, you know, we're home, but it still mean, that doesn't mean we're not busy. And I know Vin and Joe have been really active on a lot of video calls like this. So I want to thank them for taking time out of their day to join us and speak to this really important issue. I want to thank all of you that have um, stuck with us for the hour and um, listened to, the, to this talk. You, if you want to share this talk with friends of yours or family members, this will be posted on our website. It'll be on our YouTube channel. And you'll be able to share the entire the talk in its entirety um, to anyone that missed out on this uh, great conversation. In addition, I want you to add to your calendar that next week at the same time at 11 a.m. Eastern, April 28th, we'll be discussing education policy. That's another area that dovetails perfectly off of a lot of our labor reform work because of the teachers unions. Um, so we'll be talking about education policy uh, reform in Michigan and around the country. 
We hope you'll join us for that. And um, we hope you stay tuned for more events that will be coming in May. Um, and for however, however how long this goes on, we'll be um, churning out content for you to consume and share with your friends and family. And um, if we continue to get good interest, it's something that we'll potentially be doing um, even as we all return back to a level of normalcy. So thank you all for taking the time to join us here for Tuesdays with the Mackinac Center. And um, wish you all a safe and healthy and um, blessed day. Take care.